just one quick announcement. We have a little bit uh, a change of plan. <laughs> See, uh, we are lucky to have uh, Professor Edenhofer here, but he has to leave in 50 minutes or an hour. But we will have some other event after this, so we will announce this. But uh, the Dean, Will Milberg, first want to make some remarks, and then I will briefly introduce uh, Professor Edenhofer. Then we will have this presentation with a few questions, and then we having some other uh, events, yeah? So a uh, little bit change of plan, sorry, but uh, it's hard to catch him. He is usually flying through New York, and also this time he just came out of the plane, and he has to step back into the plane in three hours. So. Uh, it's hard to catch him, but he is. We are very happy to have him here. So, thank you, Billy. I don't know if this is, if this is working. Um, so I'll be very brief, so we can bring uh, Professor Edenhofer to the to the podium. And and of course, I'm just uh, very pleased, stunned actually, to see so many of you here as semester is over and students and faculty uh, trickle away. So we're really pleased to have you at the New School. I'm Will Milberg, I'm the Dean of the New School for Social Research, and of course, uh, very supportive of the work that Professor Sembler, the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis, has been doing over a number of years on climate change and the economics of climate change. It's part of a larger uh, project at the New School, the Tishman uh, Environmental Design Center, which is also a co-sponsor of this event. And the New School uh, has been you know, engaged in many different aspects of the climate change debate, most uh, specifically the economics, but also, of course, on the sides of design and on politics. And we face, of course, post-Paris, an extremely ambitious, kind of sensible, scientifically speaking, but extremely ambitious, both economically and politically speaking, and I think we have a, uh, with great delight, I will turn the podium over to Professor Edenhofer to tell us pr precisely how are we are going to meet those ambitions. So thank you very much for joining us at the New School and welcome. Uh, just another few uh, remarks. The oh, the other mics, cool. it's better, sorry, a little bit. Uh, improvisation here, but that's a new school. <laughs> so um, we will have, for I said, another event. So uh, we will have a jazz piece that will be later introduced. It's called The Warming Earth. And uh, the talk will be rather short with a few questions. Professor Eden over has to leave again to the airport. And uh, just want to make some few remarks about his, uh, well, his profile. He's uh, one of the leading uh, climate economists in Europe. Uh, he is director of the um, or co-director of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Change and the Mercator Research Institute. Uh, he is also professor at the University of uh, as a technical university of Berlin. Um, he is over a decade or ten years or longer has been working for the IPCC, which is the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change. Uh, he is a lead author in um, many assessments in assessment studies there and uh, was a co-chair of uh, the assessment on mitigation of, um, of climate change. Uh, he has many advisory positions that uh, he said I shouldn't even try to uh, uh, list all of them, but advisory position for the European Union, the OECD, for the World Bank, for the UN uh, environmental policy, uh, environmental policy issues, and a number of uh, uh, academic advisory uh, um, uh, groups and teams in Germany and, and Europe. Uh, but he is one of the persons who is uh, basically doing a very uh, sophisticated work in research and very hard, tough research on uh, uh, the economics of climate change on the one side. On the other side, he can he is able to bring this to the public through the IPCC and through many newspaper reports or interviews or radio reports, TV reports. So we are very happy to have him here today. And uh, what I said, after his talk, we will have a few questions and then we will start in another uh, part of this evening, which I will introduce uh, later. Okay, you are very, very welcome to be here at the New School. Dear uh, Willie Dean, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this wonderful invitation to the New School, which is uh, a great honor. And it is uh, in particular for European 
a, a very peculiar moment to be at this school because uh, uh, many, many important German intellectuals in a very dark time of Europe had the opportunity to teach here. And this is something uh, which for us in Europe, the new school is a very important name and it is full of history and it is a great pleasure to be here. So that's very important for me. Uh, I apologize that I create so much inconvenience uh, because of my unhealthy lifestyle, uh, just running around uh, the globe. And uh, But I promise, so I, I will change this over time. So I, I'm recovering from the IPCC now and so gradually my lifestyle will become more hopefully it will become much more healthy than it was in the past. Now, my talk today has basically two parts. Uh, the first part is very pessimistic. And when I have achieved the maximum of pessimism, so I start to become a little bit more optimistic. So and in the end, I hope I can at least provide some, some prospects uh, for the future, which which gives us hope and faith that in the end we will, we will succeed with the climate policy. Now, let me start with an observation. And it is a very simple but a very important observation. And this is emissions are rising, rising and rising despite of the climate negotiations. And this is a typical figure from the IPCC. It's until 2010. But in the last decade, we have seen even an increasing growth rate of emissions and this hasn't been changed in the last five years. Now, the most important question is, why is this the case and why was this the case? And what I would like to do is to convince you it is the case because we are in the middle of a cold renaissance. We are not in a situation where we decarbonize our world economy. Contrary, so we are carbonizing our economy. And this is something which I would like to explain you a little bit more and in particular to highlight why the growth rate in the last decade was so high. Now this is a, admittedly a typical complicated figure. Um, like the other IPCC figures, it's almost not accessible, but nevertheless you can some wisdom find some truth in, in this figure. What I would like to explain you is now the following. Here you have the driving forces, the different driving forces for emissions. Population, GDP per capita, uh, energy intensity and carbon intensity. And let me explain this a little bit. So it is clear that population drives emissions and over the last decade uh, the relative importance of population declines and the most important driver force, driving force for emissions are now GDP per capita. To a certain extent this is good because the economic growth over the last decade uh, was at least uh, to some extent uh, beneficial uh, to develop some developing countries. Then you see two other components. This is the energy intensity. Energy intensity measures basically how much primary energy you need to produce GDP. And the energy intensity has been declined, which basically means we have learned worldwide that we use now our primary energy much more efficient. Unfortunately, the declining energy efficiency has always been overcompensated by economic growth and population growth. And then there's another component, and this is something which is enormously important. So you can see between the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, we have seen a declining carbon intensity. And this was due to the fact that we have replaced around the globe our coal-fired plants uh, with uh, gas-fired plants and we see a modest decline in carbon intensity. But in the last decade the carbon intensity has been increased and this was due to the fact that coal came back. And I do not deny in my analysis that there was remarkable progress in the renewable energy sector, in particular for wind and PV. You can see this here. At a global scale the renewables have contributed significantly to the reduction of emissions. So no doubt about the technological progress in this area, but, and this is important, this progress has always been overcompensated by uh, the new coal-fired plants. And in the end, carbon intensity has been increased, at least 
uh, to a moderate extent, but uh, the crucial question is what will happen in the future? And this is something which is very worrying. Now, this is where we are now. Now, let me explain a little bit. So, what are the reasonable long-term goals? And the reasonable long-term goals has been derived by science and many climate scientists argued for long-term stabilization goal. And the Paris Agreement in last year agreed that we should stabilize our climate around the two degree target, which basically means we should limit the increase of global mean temperature around two degree and even more we should stabilize it or we should uh, uh, limit the increase of uh, uh, global mean temperature below two degrees. Some people are arguing a 1.5 degree target would be beneficial. There are many, many reasons why the two degree target is a reasonable one. For example, if we want to avoid tipping points in the Earth system, like the changed monsoon dynamics, the potential dieback of the Amazonian forest or uh, the meltdown of the ice sheets. But there are even other more gradual arguments why climate policy and avoiding dangerous climate change is even beneficial from an economic point of view. And this is a study which has been carried out by Berkey from the Stanford University. And basically he argues that there is an interesting nonlinear relationship between the annual average temperature and the growth in GDP. So, and basically it turns out that uh, because of the impact of the average temperature on labor productivity, there is basically an optimum, so to say, for economic activities. When it is too cold, it's not beneficial. If it is too hot, it's also not beneficial. The US is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit too hot. In Germany, it's a little bit too cold. So this is something what I can confirm here. And in other countries, so you have basically something around this optimum. However, and this is quite important, so the annual average temperature has an impact on the macroeconomic labor productivity. So, and then uh, uh, in this paper from Berkey and others, uh, so they have tried to uh, evaluate the global nonlinear effects of temperature on economic production. And it turns out that for unabated climate change, we see then in many countries a remarkable decline in the growth rate of GDP, in the level and in the growth rate of GDP. So Europe benefits a little bit from climate change. And if you compare uh, the benefits from Europe, for example, with Middle East and North Africa, so then this is now for many people in Europe a quite compelling argument for climate policy because now we have witnessed a significant migration movement from this area in, into Europe. And now even more right-wing people in Europe think about, start to think about uh, climate change. Now, this is something which is quite important. You can see here that unabated climate change could have dramatic economic impacts, uh, for example, in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa and so on. And this has nothing to do with the large-scale tipping points in the Earth system. This has even nothing to do with non-market impacts. These are just the economic impacts which we can measure in terms of labor productivity. So these are the reasons why many climate scientists and meanwhile more and more climate economists believe that it is a, a reasonable idea and it has some foundation and justification in science that limiting the, agree, the increase of global mean temperature around two degree is reasonable. In order to avoid specific climate risks, and I just highlighted two of them, this is the large scale singular events, and also the gradual changes in economic activities. There are other uh, important risk categories. The basic message here is that we can reduce the risk of climate change when we are able uh, to limit the increase of global mean temperature around two degrees. So this is a kind of an application of, a, of the precautionary principle. It's not something which can be derived from a physical equation. It's just a pragmatic precautionary principle. But now let me talk about the economic implication. And this is incredibly important to understand this specific point. Any 
limit any constraint on the increase of global mean temperature has the implication that there is just one limited carbon budget available which can be released into the atmosphere. So if we want to achieve the two degree limit with a likelihood of 67%, this means we can release 3000 gigatons CO2 into the atmosphere. Since industrialization, we have already uh, re uh, released 2000 gigatons. So the remaining budget is 1000 gigatons CO2. So what we can say is the temperature, the increase of the temperature can be translated into a car carbon budget. And this basically says from an economic point of view, that the atmosphere is just a limiting disposal space. And this has quite dramatic uh, implications. The implication is that we have to reduce by 2050 the emissions between 40 to 70 percent. And the range is not driven by the uncertainty about the climate system. It's just uh, driven by a portfolio of technologies which are uh, become, which become increasingly important, and these are technologies which are called carbon dioxide removal technologies. This cluster of technologies uh, should be able to absorb CO2 emissions from the atmosphere and to produce negative emissions. The importance of negative emissions I will highlight in a few minutes, but this is just what I would like to highlight. If carbon dioxide removal technologies are available, so the emission reduction until 2050 uh, can be less ambitious if these technologies are only able to a limited amount. So then we have to be much more ambitious in the next few decades. We have to reduce emissions by 70% or more. Okay, now what does this mean? Uh, this means basically this 1000 gigaton issue means that we have in the next few decades transform our worldwide energy system fundamentally. So what you can see here is we have to increase energy efficiency. Uh, we have to scale up renewables, even if we allow in some parts of the world uh, nuclear power. And we have to combine bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which is a device to produce negative emissions. I will say something about this in a, in a minute. And also, so then this is just to show you, this is the huge transformation pathways, the huge transformation requirements in all uh, relevant parts of the world, uh, in the major emitting countries, EU, US and China. So, and you can see that in the climate policy scenario, here you have a, a, a dramatic upscaling of renewables, solar, wind, geothermal, uh, bioenergy, and so on. So I will not discuss this technology transformation pathways in detail. I just would like to highlight that all the major emitter, emitting, emitter countries have to transform the energy system. So we can also say something about the sectors, what is the contribution of the individual sector, so the most important contributor to climate uh, mitigation policy for the next few decades is the power sector, the electricity sector. They have to transform it fundamentally. Then the transport sector, building industry and also land use sector. And if you think that carbon dioxide and capture and storage is not available, which means we are not in a position to capture CO2 from large scale gas and coal fired plants and to store it underground. So this means then the land use sector has contributed more. Afforestation becomes more, more important, bioenergy becomes more important in order to produce the negative emissions which are then necessary uh, when, for example, um, in the power sector, carbon dioxide and capture and storage is, is, is not available. I will not go into the technological details in my talk, but I would like to highlight one important aspect here. And this is my favorite slide when I talk about the economics of climate change mitigation. So I told you that 1000 gigatons are fundamentally allowed to be released in the, in the atmosphere if we want to limit the increase of global mean temperature around 2 degree. 1000 gigatons. To be precisely, 1000 gigatons 
this is measured from 2011 on. So what happened in the last five years, I will tell you very soon. But the most important thing is we have fossil fuels underground, coal, oil and gas, 50,000 gigatons CO2. So this graph clearly shows that we are not running out of fossil fuels. The most important scarcity fact in the 21st century are not the fossil fuels, it's just the limiting disposal space of the atmosphere. Admittedly, we will not extract all the fossil fuels because of the increasing extraction costs. But even if we take into account um, the uh, economically viable resources and reserves, it turns out that 70% of coal and one third of oil and gas has to remain underground when carbon capture and storage is available, which basically means when we have underground an additional storage here. If carbon capture and storage is not available, 90% of coal, two-thirds of oil and gas has to remain underground. And the economic implication is very, very simple. Climate policy implies that we devalue the assets of the owners of coal, oil and gas. So given this simple fact, you might agree with me that Paris was almost very close to a miracle. Now, this is something which is incredibly important. So when we think about climate policy according to Paris and after Paris, it's not just to reduce a little bit emissions. It's basically saying what can we do and what kind of policy devices do we have at hand that this uh, large amount of fossil fuels remain underground. So now let me talk a little bit about the Paris Agreement. Now I told you in the Paris Agreement basically the countries, the nation state agreed on the 1000 gigaton number. If we would like to achieve a 1.5 degree target, so from 2011 on, only 200 gigatons are available. Now, it comes now to the most important part of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement had basically three important pillars. The first one was an agreement on the long-term target. This is the 2 degree and the 1.5 degree target. The second component was so in, there, are no binding, there are no binding caps and there was no agreement on, on, on legally binding uh, emission reduction profiles. So the countries delivered just voluntary contributions. And these are called intended national determined contributions. If we add up these voluntary contributions of the governments, it turns out that by 2030 they agreed to exhaust almost the whole available carbon budget, around 800 gigatons. Which basically means the intended national determined contributions lead to a situation where after 2030 nothing is left. So, let's continue. It's, so I have, I, have, I have more to offer uh, on, on depressing use. Now let's just analyze what are the plans for coal and what are the existing, just the existing coal infrastructure. So there are new plans around the globe, around 1,400 gigawatt new coal-fired plants. And admittedly not all of them uh, will be successful, but nevertheless there is a reasonable estimation that over the economic lifetime of the coal-fired plants, the cumulative emissions will be around 400 gigatons. So, what should we do with this number when we try to evaluate the consistency of the voluntary contributions of the countries? There are basically, from my point of view, two possible interpretations. The first interpretation is they are not consistent at all. The environmental ministers pledged in Paris, but the economic ministers plan for the coal-fired plants. Or you could say the plans are consistent, but then the countries decided to reduce the emissions outside the power sector, in the transport sector, in the heat sector. And the marginal abatement costs in the power sector, in the heat sector and the transport sector are much higher 
than in the power sector. In the power sector, we have so many options to decarbonize that the marginal abatement costs are much lower. So either the plans are inconsistent or they are not, uh, from an economic point, not efficient. So these are not good signs when we want to evaluate uh, the willingness of the governments uh, to implement really Paris. Now, I showed you the 2011 numbers, but from 2011 to 2016, we already had five years. Within the last five years, we have released 200 gigatons into the atmosphere. So, which basically means there are only 600, 700 gigatons available for a two degree target. For a 1.5 degree target, no budget is left. No budget is left. This basically means each ton of CO2, which we emit now, has to be compensated in the future. And this is the reason why for a 1.5 degree target, we need just from a biophysical point of view, just from a biophysical point of view, negative emissions. You might argue negative emissions are not nice. You might argue you do not like negative emissions because the cluster of technologies which has to be applied are really risky, like bioenergy in combination with carbon capture and storage. But for a 1.5 degree target, this is just a biophysical implication. For a 2 degree target, we have a little bit more room of maneuvering, we have a little bit more flexibility, but, and this is very, very important, in the next decade, we have to think very carefully and very hard about the future of coal. So this number shows you that the renaissance of coal we have experienced in the last decade, this is not just history. And the coal renaissance didn't stop ju uh, just in China. This is something which is now an important issue in many countries. These are the 10 countries which are responsible for 90% of the new coal-fired capacities. China, India, Turkey, Vietnam, Indonesia, South Africa, Korea, Japan, Bangladesh and Taiwan. I could also mention uh, European countries like Poland and to a certain extent also Germany. So this is, these are the countries which are uh, working on coal. And one thing I would like to highlight again, when all these coal-fired plants are implemented, so then the window of opportunity to achieve a 1.5 degree target are definitely closed. And in 2030, the window of opportunity for a 2 degree target is closed. So, and this is what I'm saying, it's not just a, a, about emission reduction here and there. This is a budget problem. And we have now a window of opportunity left for the next decade. And we have to think very, very carefully about coal and policies who help us to get rid of the coal issue. Now, I start to become a little bit more optimistic. Now, what are the solutions? Now, from my point of view, one, it's, not, it's not a silver bullet, but one important solution is carbon pricing. So we have a limiting disposal space in the atmosphere, around 800 gigatons. And um, we have a lot of fossil fuels underground. And I would like to tell you what, from my point of view, a carbon price is doing. A carbon price incentivizes CO2-free technologies. It penalizes the fossil fuels according to the carbon content. And, which is even more important, carbon pricing can generate revenues. And these revenues can be used by many countries either to reduce public debt, to reduce other taxes, or to invest this in infrastructure. From my point of view, the success of Paris depends very much on one important thing. Can the countries in the next few years agree on a reasonable carbon pricing scheme? I'm not saying we need necessarily a worldwide uniform carbon price, but we need a scheme which allows the countries to increase their ambition level. I told you, in 2030, we have exhausted the whole carbon budget. So if there is no Richard Up process, so anyway, so Paris cannot be successful. But it would be 
a reasonable way when countries start to negotiate about the carbon price and increase the carbon price gradually and countries who are not willing or not able to do this should get money from climate finance. Unfortunately enough, in Paris, this is from my point of view, a major institutional innovation. There is the Green Climate Fund. There are also other multilateral institutions around climate finance. And this financial means should be used as transfers, as conditional transfers to countries uh, to increase uh, the carbon price. Over time, gradually, but nevertheless in big steps. Now, this is something which is, from my point of view, quite important. And at the same time, when we talk about carbon pricing, we have to think about the fossil fuel subsidies. So, by and large, according to the International Monetary Fund, we are subsidizing the ton of CO2 at average worldwide with 150 US dollar. So, when I am saying sometimes a carbon price of zero would be a big success, I am not saying this because I am a cynic. I am saying this taking into account the enormous amount of subsidies in the fossil fuel sector. And for me, carbon pricing and the carbon price reform requires also uh, a reform on, on the subsidies. Now, and this is, from my point of view, quite important, so that these carbon prices, which should be negotiated step by step, for example, in the next two G20 uh, summits, um, these are carbon prices where the individual nation states will receive the, uh, the revenues. So it's not, uh, from my point of view, appropriate to ask the countries to channel the revenues to a kind of multilateral institutions, but they should use the revenues domestically. And it is very interesting to see that in many developing countries, there is now a huge and an emerging infrastructure gap in water availability, sanitation, telecommunication, and access to electricity. And there's an open debate and a, a very interesting debate globally, how these countries could finance this infrastructure gap. And basically, there are many means to do this. You could think about bonds, you could think about user charges, but one very, very interesting uh, device is just carbon pricing. And we did a calculation and we calculated, so what could a moderate carbon pricing around 10 euros per ton CO2 and increasingly gradually over time, so what can we finance with this? And to make a very long story short, it turns out, for example, in 60 countries, we could provide with a moderate and a modest carbon pricing scheme universal access to clean water, almost universal access to electricity. So this would be a huge step forward in the fulfillment of the sustainable development goals. And what you can see here is that uh, the achievement of the sustainable development goals and climate policy are not a contradiction at all. They can be designed in a reasonable way so that uh, in the end, we could uh, come o overcome the trade-offs. And here, what you can see here is, uh, these are basically uh, when countries here in red, so basically uh, they, they can finance the infrastructure gaps. And if this is larger than one, this means the costs of infrastructure are larger than the revenues. But you can see in most countries, this moderate carbon pricing scheme allows them to finance the infrastructure. Now, um, I could say something on, on carbon pricing schemes in, in Europe about the EU ETS and why the EU ETS is failing. I will not uh, 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 bother you with uh, this uh, change uh, European uh, issues. Just I would like to highlight that the European emissions trading scheme is not functioning at all. And I could say probably in the discussion a little bit more about this, but I would like to give you a little bit more room for discussion. I would like just to highlight that after Paris, we have seen a decline in the CO2 prices. And one of the reasons is that the traders do not really trust that we will have in Europe a reasonable and a binding 
and a long-term climate policy after 2020. So, and, and this is something which is deeply worrying that obviously in many corners around the globe, people could lose the trust in climate policy. Paris was by any standards a, 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 a success, a diplomatic success. It was a great success. But now the real thing is the climate policy after Paris. And here we could fail. Humankind could fail. And uh, this is something which is, from my point of view, um, which we should analyze very carefully and we should make reasonable proposals to the negotiators uh, to find a way, step by step, uh, to increase the ambition, to find the right policy instruments. And when they find the right policy instrument tailor-made for the uh, countries, so then we should tell people and the decision makers that carbon pricing, which is from my point of view not the only instrument, but it's an incredibly important policy instrument, that carbon pricing has many, many advantages. It incentivizes uh, carbon-free technologies. It penalizes the use of fossil fuels. It generates revenues and this revenues could be used to finance the sustainable development goals. I am fully aware this is a very moderate proposal. It's not a big utopian proposal, but this is a moderate step. And now it's time to think about carriages, moderate steps, because when the window of opportunity is closed, then we are really doomed to fail. We have now a decade ahead of us and we should use this decade very wisely uh, to implement a successful climate policy. Thank you very much.